Wilmer, thanks so much for taking some time with us today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's a real pleasure. Well, Looking great. forward to this. Yeah. Good. Well, you know, we're bringing together at this Global City Conference um, uh, three different types of groups here in Minnesota. We're bringing together business leaders who are doing work around the world. We're bringing together the increasing number of people in this community who have a lived experience around the world, and we're bringing together global citizens, no matter where they live. Uh, they care about what's going on. You happen mm -hmm. to be all three of those. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be helpful to maybe start with you talking a bit about your path, being born in Bangladesh and mm -hmm. how you uh, have come to this spot. And I, I think uh, over the next few minutes, I want to help us fill in the blanks about what we can learn from you about how we should uh, be engaged in the rest of the, mm -hmm. of the world. Well, a lot of it is uh, good luck and good fortune. <laughs> uh, a lot of gratitude to my parents. Uh, but more than that, and even more than that, are people who made bets on me. Oh. Uh, and I think those are probably the most important things. Yeah. Uh, just being lucky enough to, uh, to be at the right place at the right time and, and have some great uh, people who help me. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, ha it has been a global journey. Well, take us back there. Like, what was it? You're a kid growing up, and uh, how did you see the rest of the world? Did you imagine that this would be your path? Um, not really, not early on, yeah. not early on. Um, I'll, I'll say the story and, uh, and uh, you know, you can decide how useful it really is. Okay. But um, actually, I was born in, um, in, in India, what is now India, right. um, uh, because, uh, you know, my mother's family actually came from there, from uh, uh, close to the border of Bangladesh, mm -hmm. but that's where they came from. I grew up in Bangladesh, but during the time uh, as I was growing up, I also went to school in, in Pakistan because when I was growing up, it was actually one country. Right. And so I was born in India. I come from Bangladesh. Uh, that's where all my relatives are. We've got family houses and all that. I spent, you know, six or seven or more of my formative years in Pakistan. And although from a distance here, it seems like, well, you know, they're thousand miles apart here and there, what's the big deal? They're all like Indian subcontinent. If you're over there, going through those three different countries, it's like three different universes. Right. Uh, the, the political systems are different, the cultures are at that level different, the food is different, uh, the languages are different. Um, and so very early on, uh, in a very sort of uh, natural way, it gave me a sense of diversity. Well, and it's, it's an important message to take out of this because I think so often in our country we're painting with a very broad yeah. brush about yeah. uh, Asia and South Asia. Sure, <laughs> these, sure. These huge ter terms on that. Yeah, but with different people and cultures and all that. And I mean, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because in the scheme of things there are lots of similarities, similarities as well. But when you're living there, it's different enough that you learn from that. Right. And then, you know, I was fortunate enough... Um, that my parents um, gave me an English education. So, um, you know, in, in the Indian subcontinent, there are lots of schools which are run by uh, sometimes by missionaries and others, but they're, they're really English language schools. And, uh, and I was taught in English from a very early age. In fact, I probably speak it better than any other language. I, I was taught everything in English. And at that time, it may or may not have been obvious, but that's a distinct advantage. And so when I finally went to England, for a variety of reasons, and uh, frankly, like uh, you asked before, uh, during my teenage years, I thought maybe I'd go abroad, but then I'd come back again. But there were all kinds of political disturbances and things like that happened, uh, which forced me to uh, leave earlier than I normally would. Um, I was fortunate enough to have an uncle in England uh, with whom I stayed. I was also fortunate that in those days the, uh, the college uh, fees in England were 250 pounds a year, uh, which was affordable. Uh, and I uh, went to a good university there in London and, uh, and living in London for uh, eight years, again during my late teenage and, uh, years and early 20s, doing my bachelor's degree, there, doing a PhD there, gave me a cosmopolitan, co cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan sense. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, the British uh, culture a little bit. Uh, so that gave me um, uh, quite a broad uh, sort of uh, view on, on life and how you grow up. My wife is English, so that's another uh, 
layer of diversity there. And then during my studies, I spent time in the, in the United States. Uh, I visited here. I worked in Alabama as an electrician for um, you know, a couple of months because my sister was there as a student. Um, I uh, went around by Greyhound bus around the whole country, and then in a subsequent visit, I hitchhiked around the U.S. So if you, while I was living in England doing my PhD, so if you put all this together, I think you can get a sense of the breadth of, um, of views and, and perspectives that one develops uh, living through all of this. So when you first came to live in this country, you'd yeah. already lived in the India, UK. Pakistan, Bangladesh. And the UK. In, in the UK. And you were married to a woman from the UK. So you had a lot of Different. global experience. Exactly, yeah. One of the things that um, is often not noted is what's happening to this community here is now in Minneapolis-St. Paul, we have an enormous number of people who've lived in other places. Right. And their paths are often... Um, ones that have a lot of trauma in it as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, when you think about that and you think about building a global workforce, what sort of skills did you pick up by the time you got here that gave you an, a better ability to do the global business you're doing today? Well, actually, the United States is a very natural home for this because, um, um, <coughs> you know, diversity in the, in the United States is, uh, is common. I mean, this country is built on people coming from different places. Right people who are actually far less fortunate than I've been uh, in their journey to the United States. And the one thing that I'll tell you about the United States is that there isn't a country in the world where, where if you work hard, it doesn't matter where you come from, and you dem demonstrate results, you will get rewarded. Um, you know, it doesn't matter about you know, who your father is and all this kind of other kind of stuff, it's what you do. And I think that's true in the United States. And, and because of that common goal, People learn to work with each other, whether they speak the same language or not, as long as they can uh, drive the common goal and they figure out how to communicate with each other and they learn the language. So <coughs> I think the environment in the United States is one that truly people who live here don't always appreciate. Mm -hmm. But if you compare it to other countries in the world, it's really one of the most open cultures that exists, uh, that's welcoming, that, uh, that gives everyone an equal opportunity. You gotta work hard for it. Right. You know, everything's not always fair, uh, but still you have an opportunity and results count. Uh, and so um, all, the, all that other stuff gave me uh, some ability to integrate with different people of different backgrounds more easily. I think the culture in the United States is a bigger factor than my background. When you were working side by side with people who <coughs> lived all their life in the United States. Yeah. Were there moments when you could feel that the lived experience you had crossing all these boundaries gave you an insight that someone who lived in the States all their time uh, might, not, uh, might not have had? Well, you know, I never really thought about it that way. Yeah. Um, it was more like I was more eager to learn from them right. about their upbringing and um, grow with that, about sports, about their habits and um, I found that uh, to be something that was uh, that I could learn from, right. rather than uh, me teach them. I mean, that might have happened, but but I was more interested in learning from them, and I, I wasn't conscious. And this happened when I was, you know, on the Greyhound bus or hitchhiking. I met mm -hmm. all kinds of people, okay. uh, Americans from different backgrounds, from farms, from cities, immigrants, off the big uh, government officials, businessmen, students, you name it. Everybody. And so I got a great perspective from the country on people, and I had no trouble at all striking a dialogue, a friendly dialogue, with no matter who they were. I mean, there was some, obviously, some risk associated with yeah. some of this, but, but I was lucky enough that nothing, <laughs> nothing like that happened. But, uh, <coughs> but all along, the, um, the, 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 I got tremendous enjoyment out of just interacting with people and making friends. Yeah. I first met you uh, when I was still mayor, yeah. and the new CEO was at Medtronic, and so I came out to meet the new CEO. We yeah. had a very nice lunch here, and, and uh, my big pitch was trying to talk to you about the step-up job program, and I was trying to uh, make the case to you, you know, we've got all these 
young people now who are from all over the world, and we want to get them into businesses. And yeah. you were really nice to listen to the pitch, but you didn't need the pitch. You played back to me pretty clearly that you wanted a workforce in Medtronic that had global fluency, that could cross around the world. How do you um, think about this increasingly diverse population we have in Minnesota? Yeah. And uh, what is that potentially able to help you with uh, in yeah. building a workforce that can do work around the globe? I think working on the on the globe is is a factor, but that's not the only factor. Mm -hmm. I think an equally important factor, and perhaps a bigger factor, <coughs> is that we have a workforce um, who has uh, which which has a diverse perspective. Uh, experiences are different. Their thought process uh, and their upbringing has given them certain notions that are different from someone who hasn't been through that experience. Mm -hmm. I think the melding of these okay. into solving a problem, whether it's globalization or just a local problem, uh, is a valuable perspective. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits of diversity, in that you get people with different, with different backgrounds uh, working together. You know, in business, the, um, the most important thing that one does is to make judgment calls, is to make decisions. Um, and those are big decisions. And the quality of a business and, uh, and the success of a business in the end results in how many correct decisions one has made over a period of time. Uh, whether it be in a localized environment where you're making a decision about some, uh, you know, buying something or, or whatever in your daily work, or it's a major decision about, you know, whatever, your workforce or where you want to be or which big company you want to buy, you know, there's big things like that. But all of them are decisions. And the collective um, sort of uh, quality of these decisions is, in the end, almost, you can almost say factually, going to decide the success of your business or not. And, and as you make the decision, if you have different perspectives in allowing you to make that decision, you'll almost certainly make a better decision or fewer mistakes right. because you'll get different viewpoints solving the same problem. And you may miss things that may seem obvious to one person and it's not obvious to someone else. And because of that, you'll end up making a better decision. So overall, from a statistical perspective, I think you'll find that diversity leads to better decisions and therefore leads to a better business. So that's, that's an aspect that's independent of globalization. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> I do think that globalization itself, with the backgrounds of the people that we have here, uh, and a link to uh, some other country or region um, adds a new flavor uh, of opportunity that can allow us to perhaps uh, export more in some ways, to, to set up linkages with these other uh, regions in, in, in different ways and, and bring more familiarity so we can create good solutions with other regions of the world. So there are opportunities there. But I hate to be too general about that. That depends on the business you're in and what sure. you're trying to solve and whether it's real or not. Uh, but I, I think just having people of different backgrounds in this uh, state is actually a big advantage for the state. You know, you do such a good job of talking about how you can <coughs> make a better decision when you have different perspectives. And increasingly, I'm hearing that viewpoint from business leaders. It's, it's kind of interesting um, doing a lot of work with the young people who represent these more diverse backgrounds through yeah. our Step Up program or anything else, that they often don't see that yet, that it's almost easier for the employers to see that than for the young people to see this, uh, the skill they have in coming from another country or in being, say, an African-American boy in North Minneapolis <coughs> crossing boundaries to go downtown and back. You know, people who have crossed boundaries have – um, assets, and we've started a new effort called Connects MSP that takes mm -hmm. Step Up grads and these others and connects it right to employers. But help those young people who are who we believe have that value. Help them understand. I mean, how do they package that for you? How do they, when they are in an interview, how do they really express the fact that they have that experience? Is, how do you, yeah. how have you told that? No, story? I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Yeah. Uh, f in, in, the, in the perspective that you're talking about in the interview process, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the interview process brings along with it other dimensions. Right. And um, <coughs> you just have to take for granted that the diverse thinking is going to come along with it. Diverse thinking isn't going to replace a skill set. 
I mean, if, if you're going to hire an engineer, uh, you're not going to hire somebody who doesn't have engineering skills just because they come from somewhere. Right. So the, the, the nature of the job is going to dominate. And you've just got to assume that because a person has a different background, and, and you know, I talk about uh, global background as one aspect of diversity. Gender is another aspect of diversity. Just coming from different industries is another aspect of di diversity. So there's different aspects of diversity. And the more differences you can find, mm. uh, the more you'll get naturally into it. I think trying to design that and have a portion of each, uh, I think that's very difficult. Yeah. Um, this is one of the reasons we wanted to do this global convening is it's a, <coughs> it's a pretty pivotal time for the whole notion of globalism right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing all sorts of challenges around the world with uh, we're seeing challenges here in this country, and you're trying to lead a, a huge global presence yeah. through all of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right after the election, you um, were a little worried about uh, yeah. messages out there, and you stood up and made some, uh, hopefully you're sharing comments to your employees. How do you help employees and, and business partners navigate through what's a pretty complicated period for globalism right now? I think um, stick to your values. Uh, do the right things, have confidence when you do the right things, and it'll work out. That, that's one aspect. I, I think the, uh, uh, f to, the <coughs> to the employees, I think a broader question, though, that you state uh, more generally about globalization is a much more complex question. I mean, that's much more political in nature, uh, and, you know, you can see different perspectives to too much globalization sometimes um, and the dynamics that it causes if it's not planned correctly in terms of you know refugees and all this kind of stuff but but everything has a has a reason for it um, I, I think that's a much more complicated question I, I think though that um, one thing that global businesses have shown and it can be um, it can be somewhat controversial in, in, in thinking about it that way but in general global businesses have been able to meld a workforce together from all kinds of different places in the world and solve a problem. We have engineers from, with backgrounds from all kinds of different countries uh, solving a current problem when well, those countries may be at loggerheads with each other and may fight each other or, or people with different backgrounds. When they work for a company uh, and they're attacking a problem, all that seems to go away. Why? Because they have a common goal a common goal that's cross-boundary, hmm. that benefits people in an absolute sense. So I think uh, the essence of globalization has to be able to find global go uh, common goals. Right. I, I think if you cannot do that, then, uh, then you'll find local goals and then the boundaries will start to creep up. And so um, that dynamic of, of focusing on global goals that are fundamentally doing good and, and you'll get people from different backgrounds and countries to rally around that and forget everything else. I mean, we get is Israelis and Palestinians and Arabs and whatnot in one team, and there's never any problem at all. And they're going out there and solving a problem, and they're depending on each other, and you wouldn't know. You, I, w I, I don't think I've even had one problem like that. Um, and yet when you go talk to countries, you right. can't even go from one country <laughs> to another country. And so... I think the, uh, the, one of the benefits of a global corporation is to be able to meld these different cultures mm -hmm. into, a into a common goal. And, and finding more common goals for us that benefits everybody, I think, can only help. That's great. That's a wonderful point. Let me, let me turn a bit to philanthropy for yeah. a minute. And um, you've <coughs> done business around the world. You've yeah. lived in other places. You've seen huge gaps. Yes. Um, when you think of your own interests on what you want to help make better from a human perspective. Yeah. There are a lot of needs in the world. Right. How do you navigate that? Just saying, I, I, I think this is good advice for the, the donors who are going to be in the room with us and the foundations <coughs> making choices. You can't do everything. That's correct. Yeah. How do you make a choice? Well, um, y th that depends on the individual. For me personally, yeah. you know, healthcare becomes a priority because I'm in the middle of that. It doesn't have to be for everybody. Education could be a priority for somebody. There's all kinds of different priorities that people may have. But for me, 
healthcare is a priority because I understand it, I've seen it, and uh, I know that a difference can be made in saving people's lives and extending their lives and, 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 and so on. And so, and that's enough. I don't need to solve everything. If we can solve, if we can help a few people live longer in the world, that's worth a lot. Okay, so, so for me, focusing on, on healthcare makes sense. I think to other donors, picking one or two causes that they really believe in is probably an important focusing vehicle. I think the second thing that uh, we've learned <coughs> over the last several years as we've tried to um, you know, deploy uh, money to help others is the concept of uh, impact investing. Mm. In other words, um, judge your charity, if you like, by the impact that it makes. And it's almost like a revenue except it's impact. Right. And you look at it with the same degree of discipline and rigor that you look at a business, except you're looking at impact. Uh, now, the moment I say that, <coughs> if, you, if you are going to do it like that, you've got to be strict about how you define an impact. It has to be consistent. It has to be measurable. Uh, it has to be real. Uh, so in other words, uh, training a physician may or may not be an impact. Curing an illness is an impact. So you've got to... You, know, you can train all the physicians you want and then they don't have any hospitals to go to or primary care offices to serve patients. That, has ha that hasn't had any impact at all. Right. So you have to be pretty precise and clear-headed about what an impact is and then try to drive funds towards that to get maximum benefit. And there's some examples um, that we've run across which are good, others which are more difficult to put together. But in general, the community... Uh, who's uh, developing these solutions have been very receptive to this thought process. And it gives you a very clear, logical way to approach things because, uh, you know, you don't want to be just giving funds away because someone's making a nice pitch or there's your friend or, right. or, or, or whatever. I mean, those things can be ideas. They can be opportunities. But I think the final decision should really be made after a very thoughtful process where you actually try to quantify impact as much as you can. That's the way we're thinking about it. I mean, these are easier said than done, but, um, but we're, we're making an effort. What have you <coughs> learned over time about uh, organizations that are especially doing good work? I mean, you've been around the world. You guys are doing all sorts of great work with your foundation. Um, hold up for our, our donors a couple of uh, groups doing good work around the globe that you actually... Uh, I think a number of things. You know, a firm commitment, a real belief, a sincere belief in what people do, mm -hmm. I think those th that is sort of ground zero. You have to have that. And that you're in that business not to make money or anything, but to really make a difference in people's lives in some way. So having a real inner belief in that is pretty important and a passion around that as opposed to anything else. I think beyond that... Uh, <coughs> The, the organizations who really have taken uh, impact and discipline and measuring their outcomes uh, and, then, and, then, and then sort of directing their funding according to that, um, I think are the most successful. Um, even if they're small, they, they, they make the biggest difference. I think the other aspect that goes often without, um, without saying is the ability of an organization to use others. In other words, um, there is uh, cash funding and then there's in-kind funding. And if you, can, if you can find a way, if an organization can find a way to leverage their cash amount to get more in-kind help by people's hours mm -hmm. directed in the right way, that has to be possible. Then I think you really accelerate the value of an organization because you're using somebody's cash and you're leveraging it up by using somebody else's time but focused on the same goal. So when you put all that stuff together, there are some organizations who do that particularly well. In general, uh, if I were to boil this down to one or two themes, the passion, but equally importantly, the focus. Mm. The f more focused an organization is, I find the better they do. Save the Children is a great example. Uh, children is their focus. And they do an outstanding job because that's what they focus on. And they're experts at that. Uh, locally, we've got Children's uh, Heartlink, which, which uh, I'm a real fan of, mm -hmm. where uh, 
It's a very specific uh, aspect of healthcare, which is congenital, congenital heart disease in children in, in, uh, in the third world. And, um, and so it's very focused uh, uh, sort of effort. It takes time to build that expertise. The, the charity is not that easy to do effectively. Right. Uh, just throwing money somewhere isn't enough. It's, it's the actions that have to follow. And if you try to do too many things at one time, it's usually very difficult. Right. You know, one thing that you <coughs> touched on there is this whole point of, of uh, how to inspire others and who's, who's doing the great work. You have a big workforce. Yeah. And Medtronic volunteers have done amazing things here and, and yeah. around the world. It's also at a time when a lot of companies are really rethinking how much they give to coordinated campaigns, how much yeah. they volunteer. How do you build into an organization the value, or do, how do you perpetuate the yeah. value of giving back and especially saying that uh, Medtronic is putting funds around the world yeah. But yeah. to get employees to also give something yeah. of themselves? I think um, Medtronic is fortunate because uh, back in 1960, when Earl Bakken and his colleagues <coughs> wrote the mission of Medtronic, it went well beyond what the company's strategy business strategy should be. Uh, that was, of course, included in that we're a technology company focused on alleviating pain, restoring health, and extending life. But there are several tenets to the mission, and one tenet, tenet number six, spells out very clearly that uh, Medtronic should be a good citizen in the community that they're in. And that m mission statement directs all 80,000 employees of Medtronic. This is not a... Uh, <coughs> a discussion or a choice or anything like that. This is second nature. Right. Uh, we have a month, the month of June, where the, that tenant, because it's tenant six, uh, we focus on and we do things. And people enjoy it. <coughs> that's part of their life. That's part of their jobs. Uh, and, uh, and we give back, whether it's volunteering somewhere in our own, with our own hours, whether it's giving money to something, whether it's through the company, whether it's just ourselves. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this focus on helping others, uh, sort of um, in a, written in our mission, um, you know, makes all the difference. So in many ways, it's a relatively easy task for me from that aspect in that I didn't have to sell anybody on anything. It was already in the mission. It was already part of the culture. And it's one that uh, the generations of leaders of Medtronic have, uh, have held up high and one that um, I think um, we'll always keep in, in, in the mission in its entirety, we'll always keep, but certainly this ten at six as well. Well, Omar, thank you so much. Thank you. We sure appreciate your help. Thanks a lot. Your Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.